Here we go. Welcome to another episode of Two Ales and Hockey Tales with Wally. And today I'm so excited to have on a three-time Zweite Bundesliga Deutsche Meister, a 17-year pro that took him through Canada, the U.S., Sweden, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, and 11 years in Germany. His jersey is retired in Biedingheim, Germany, number 27, JK27, big sexy, and I was little sexy, Justin Kelly. How are you today? Good, man. It's good to connect with you on this. It's great. It's been forever. Um, I think the last time we saw each other, we were just talking about a pre-show was what, 2012? Yeah, yeah it's, been a, it's been a minute, man. It's too long. It sure has. Um, yeah. So I guess I got to give the backstory of how we know each other. Uh, basically, um, to this day, I still wish we would have played together more in my career. Um, it was my most successful season in hockey. Um, it was about the most fun I've had as well, even with a psychotic coach, um, just because of how well me and you played together. Um and uh, we've also been in an erotic photo shoot together, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but that's how we know each other was mainly from our season and four games in Beatingheim together. Yeah, it was, I mean, that was a good run. It was, you know, you have chemistry with line mates and, and it just clicks for whatever reason. And those two years were uh, pretty special when we played together. A lot of fun, like you said, and that team I heard, you know, the, Schmitty podcast and that team was we had a good group that got along off the ice and it led to success and um, yeah it was just fun every day even though we had the coach and the, the setup um, it was a fun year and good group of guys so and playing with you is also a good time and I think it's a skilled player and you know he had success that season and it would have been nice to play a few more years and, and light the lamp again so yeah, so what happened was we played one year together, won the championship. I think we were second and third in the league in scoring. Um, yeah. So we win the championship, and then the next season, I had offers to go elsewhere. Elsewhere, You obviously would have. Um, we both decided to go back because of how much fun we had had and that I had thought we were going to be going up when I signed um, to the first league because I knew we were going to win. Um, but, uh, where was I going with that? Yeah. So we only played a season in four games, but what a season it was. And then after that season, I get hurt and we never play together ever again. That's right. You had the, the knee injury early and, uh, that was it for big and little sexy duo. So <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, we were big and little sexies together though. Cause the hockey we were making together was sexy. in in my opinion, <laughs> yeah, I, was, um, like, I forgot that there was a big thing that we were going to, you know, play in the first league after winning the championship and all that goes with that. And so there was a lot of speculation and players wondering what was going to happen. So I remember that time now they bring it up with contracts and, and players um, deciding what they were going to do in that you know, that February to April range when things start to happen with contracts in Europe. So that does, that does come back to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess before we get into um, kind of, yeah, I want to get into it right now. My most interesting day as a professional hockey player um, was in Biedingheim, Germany. Uh, they would, they would have the team, do all these different uh, functions, whatever they were, lunches, reading books to kids in class. Um, but sometimes they just put a list up and say, you guys got to be here at this time. And they told us we had to be at the rink Monday at, I believe, 11 a.m., correct? Yeah it, was, yeah, it was 10 or 11. Like you said, no one really knows when you sign up for these uh, PR things what they're going to be. You just kind of volunteer. So, yeah, that was the start of that. And so you, so you know which day I'm talking about. Yes, I remember this day clearly. 
<laughs> okay, so um, this was my first season in Beatingheim. I was just getting my feet wet in the land suit, and then I switched to Beatingheim. And this is about the first month on the team, maybe second month. We're just getting comfortable in Beatingheim. And then I have a function Monday at 11 a.m., and I tell Lisa, I got a function at the rink. Um, I don't know how long it'll be. I don't know what we're doing, um, but I'll, I'll be back. Um, and then we showed up at the rink and um, they said we were doing a photo shoot. Um, and then a bus of, what would you call them? Uh, mo mo models, I guess. Models would be the polite term. Yeah, I, whatever. <laughs> they were, uh, I believe they were um, Eastern European or perhaps from Russia, right? They were professionals of some sort, yeah. Yes. So uh, <laughs> so they showed up and there was one that was the boss. Um, we called her the Madame, but um, we were with, what, about four other German guys, right? There was Dotsy, Sari, who else was there? Uh, Reens was there. Sari, yeah, Dotsy, me, you, and that was it. And Kozlov. Kozlov, correct, yeah. So, um yeah, so they have a list of all these different shots we're going to take. <laughs> and the first one was that we better get dressed. This was before we really knew what was going on, I believe. We started getting our equipment on, and we had heard we were doing a photo shoot, right? That's all. That was the notes we got. It was basically just a calendar photo shoot. And when that's written there, you just you know assume that it's just us on the ice and with our gear. And kind of point and shoot and takes you know an hour to do these things so but little did we know when we get on the ice we get half dressed i believe and we're kind of still in the dark as to what's going on so i think we got on the ice and started passing the puck around or doing something and then all the one the girls come out on the ice i remember and uh just drop trial basically and we're like okay we're in what is happening here did, did did they wear anything odd to the ice or did they just come out straight naked with just like hockey skates and or figure skates whatever they just came out with skates and a hockey stick right i don't remember skates i just remember a robe and then they just said pass the puck around there's six of us just you know okay. think right we do a calendar shoot and then this woman comes in the middle of us and they start snapping photos and we're like with no background or no communication as to what we're doing. And so we all look at each other like, what is going on here? <laughs> um, it, it was, you know, it was an interesting little moment there. <laughs> um, yeah. When we all didn't know what was happening, and uh, then we found out that, or yeah, you're right. They weren't skating because they didn't know how to skate. No, no they yeah. were just on the ice, right? And we were supposed to pretend we were playing a hockey game with them. So I believe they just had hockey sticks. So then after yeah. that, yeah. after that shot, because <clears throat> I, I, the, the planner of this event was Oliver Meyer. Is that not his name? That's his name. I just, I don't know who. Who organized that he specific. organized it he was like he organized it and um did he how long did he work for the Steelers after because he uh, but when we get more into this story he told me that he had the pictures and he was gonna send me some so I had them for my lifetime and I never got them I but, want to know where they are yeah I mean as we go along the story yeah it's the funny thing is no one's ever seen the pictures of that day and and what happened to that idea of that calendar, you know, being sold at the fan shop and all that. So it was, it's still a mystery and something, uh, you know, I'd like to see and, and telling the story now, I'd like to see it, some of those photos. So I would, uh, I would absolutely love to see the photos. So after the scene of us playing hockey against the naked models, uh, the next scene I believe was, uh, we were sitting on the bench and I believe they made us take uh, hold on after, before they got us to do that. They realized how we were so scared and did not want to be there and did not want to be doing it and thought this is so unprofessional. This is so ridiculous. And then Oliver's next great idea was do you guys 
want to have some drinks to loosen up, which it was, it was a great idea. Cause there was no way I was doing that without a drink or two. Cause that was nuts. Yeah. yeah I remember that question and we're all like, cause usually Monday is like off for us too. So we just thought, you know, everyone was pretty stiff at, at, the, at the start. And there was actually a, no one there from the organization, like kind of coordinating our side of things. We were just there as players. So it was no like yes and no, or, what to do and not to do we just kind of went with it and the, the day unfolded as it did you know with no supervision um <laughs> and uh you know we kind of on the whim of this photographer and and their madame? directions and yeah they're madame yeah. so yeah, the, the the alcohol probably helped uh ease, ease the rest of the day for sure yes yeah, so the next step was they had someone run out and grab say a 12 pack of beers to let us loose it up. And then the next scene is they made us be topless. We had our under equipment on, but we had to be topless on the bench. And then the models pretended they were the coaches and had like the, you know, the make it pretend they were making plays and whistles around. And that was it. Right. They, they were, they were still naked. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, they just every like top. Can you take the top gear off and, and all that? And just some, <laughs> some things. It was just for us at the for the first hour. It was uh, you know what what are we doing here kind of thing. And so, I literally when I I just couldn't believe that my hockey team had not asked me if I was okay with this. Never. Yeah like and then all of a sudden we were just on the ice and then the girls come out and then it's like oh are you guys not okay with this and we're like are are we supposed to be okay with this yeah yeah is when you look back at that day it was (laughs) i mean it's funny to talk about it now but yeah from that perspective it's it's interesting that you know none none of those conversations and and the fact that they were going to sell this in the fan shop was interesting as well as well right like you know um Uh, so yeah um so the other highlights for the day for me were i was very nervous so that after we got off the ice they had penciled me in as the guy to get a massage Mm -hmm. um and there was going to be a naked girl massaging me and i was going to be on the bench and i was like I don't think I should do this. Like I know Jeremy's got a different lifestyle and a different view of this, but I don't think I should do this. I know you guys are asking me to, but then the photographer decided I didn't have the body type for the photo anyways. You got it replaced on that one. So I, I, remember I, was, I was sitting in the room and they were like, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> they brought in the big jack german instead of me like i, I didn't even get in the photo like face down <laughs> yeah so anyways the last uh the last picture uh both of us did not partake um so we were only in the ones on the ice i don't think we got involved in any other ones because i was kicked out of the massage photo but the last picture of the day they said, okay, guys, good work today. You've done a great job. Now, everybody in the showers. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone looks at each other like, what? I was, I was like, oh, you know, have at her. Well, I was like, like my wife just flew over here like two weeks ago. Uh, should I just like what (laughs) like um so that's just a completely different lifestyle because um they that's just like okay over there and actually the team's idea which i don't know if is the entire organization's idea or perhaps one individuals who should send me the photos so (laughs) we can see them but um it was absolutely ridiculous and they were going to sell them in the fan shop to the fans of us playing hockey with models and then them having an actual shower scene yeah it was uh 
you know, like the take on the hockey player calendar thing just went sideways in a hurry. So it was, it was a bizarre, bizarre day and an uh, interesting approach to how to sell things in the fan shop. <laughs> <laughs> I guess every team's try to make money in their own ways, but uh, selling my body just won't work, <laughs> folks. <laughs> All right. Okay. I just needed to talk to someone and validate that story because yeah. I, I do not have the pictures and I, you know, that it, it, it just hasn't been proven until today that I have a second witness. Um, yeah. So Oliver Meyer, we're looking for the pictures. If you still got them on the old hard drive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's only six, six of us players. So five, six guys there. So, uh, so I can confirm, I can confirm your story of Aldo anytime. Thanks buddy. Cause uh, a day like that will never ever happen again in my life. And uh, never thought it ever would because I never thought uh, being a professional hockey player, that was part of the uh, job description. Uh, <laughs> so anyways, we got to get into this now. So that was a story we got had to do off the hop here. So now it's uh where did you grow up and how did you get into hockey? And then did you go junior major junior NCAA route for the fans? I already know all this. Yeah. I mean, I grew up, I was born in Vancouver on the West coast, um, you know, played minor hockey out here till Bantam. And then, uh, you know, I wasn't drafted as a, Bantam draft in the dub or anything. I was listed my second year of Bantam with Spokane. And I didn't really know much about the dub. Actually, my whole, you know, youth development, I was going to go to college, college route the whole time in your head. And, and then I just went down to camp as, as a 16-year-old listed player to Spokane and um, had a good camp and ended up making the team as a 16-year-old player. So I just kind of got swept up in that. And your eyes are kind of, widen when you go down to a, an organization like that as a 16 year old and just the the size and magnitude of the rank and, and the professionalism so you kind of get swept up at, as a young kid and just kind of say yes and and that was the journey I went to you know you didn't really think about it after you make a decision like that but looking back you might need some time when they you know sit you down in a room and say they'd like to keep you but you don't uh, always take the time to make those big decisions so but it you know, I went to dub route, played five years in a major junior and learned a lot in those five years about the, you know, business of hockey and, 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 and how that all works at a, at a young age, which most junior players, you know, do. It's, so, uh, so did you just grow up playing basically triple A off the hop and right away, all the way through, you're just a good player, big, tall, dang. Yeah, I, mean, I wasn't tall until I, I kind of grew late. So I was, you know, no, wasn't, uh, I didn't fill out and grow till, you know, later 16, 17, 18 kind of growth spurt. Um, so I went, when I went to like Spokane's camp, for example, I was six feet, you know, five eleven, six feet. And then when I left junior, I was six, four, like two twenty. So it, uh, matured a lot in those five years was physically, um, but yeah, I played rep, you know, all minor hockey and, 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 and you know, summer leagues and, and, and that kind of thing that's pretty, you know, the 12 month thing was just getting going in hockey when I was at that age. And now it's, you know, it's pretty common to, to not take time off. I think that's disgusting. Yeah, um, it was, you know, I was just started. So, but I played a lot of other sports as a kid and I, you know, I feel like that's important too in, the, in this day and age for, for training athletes. I, I became a better athlete by playing a lot of sports um, early in my life, like basketball, golf, soccer, football, whatever you could, you know, spend time with, you know, it teaches you a lot of things in the body and makes you a better athlete than a hockey player second. So that kind of comes into the fold as you see, you have talent and, you know, you know, you start to get noticed by scouts and, and as a young kid, and, and then, then you kind of, you know, pick one sport kind of thing. So. Um, I, yeah, I completely agree. Like I, there's no reason especially at a young age to be playing hockey year round. There's too many sports out there in the world to make you an athlete before a hockey player. Like who knows if you're, who knows if you're more passionate about a different sport or anything, like whatever you're going to get drawn to, is probably going to be what you're best at usually. But, um, 
Okay. Yeah. Next yeah. story. I got something else here though. So um after junior, you're in Spokane. Mm-hmm. You didn't get drafted. You're a big guy. You probably put up some points, I'm assuming, after I played with you. Like I'm assuming you put up some points. Were you drafted? Because I saw you went to Sweden immediately mm-hmm. right out of major junior. Yeah, like I had a um a good 20 year old season in the WHL. And at that time, a lot of 20 year old free agents were signing, you know, lucrative contracts because they could choose teams. Um, and then at the end of the season, I didn't have an agent or anything that year. And I, at the end of the season, my GM in, in Saskatoon just asked me if I'd be interested in Europe. And um, I said, yeah, for sure. And at the time, guys going to Europe at that age wasn't as common um, as it is now. Uh, usually guys, you know, my era would go to the AHL or East Coast and, and do that right away and, and, try, and try and, you know, chase the NHL dream. And for some reason, I just co- was called to, you know, this opportunity in Sweden and I jumped that I didn't really think about. It. I just kind of rolled with it um, and went over there. And actually, in hindsight, that changed my whole life trajectory and my hockey trajectory as well. And um, looking back on my career, that decision changed changed a lot for me as 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 a person and how to look at the game because uh, I went to Sweden as a you know a 20 year old kid first year pro um first, first year in Europe you have to learn a lot of things on your own when you're doing that and, and I grew up a lot and I also learned the whole world landscape of the sport and what's what's what opportunities are for you as a player not just in North America and so um it was, it was a good decision in the end, maybe not at the time, you know, I came back to North America because I just wanted to try, try the, to chase the dream. And so I came back and played three years, you know, on the coast in the A and, and stuff like that. But I, in the back of my head, I knew Europe, uh, I'd be back there soon. And that's why I went back over again quickly after playing in the North American pro leagues. Um, I, now that you say that it makes me think of like why I went over there and how it changed me as a person. And um, like the food, the different things, the way it affects you, like the different people we've met, the different cultures you've touched, like it makes you much more aware of what's going on in the world. And especially like you turn on like CNN and you actually have been to where you're looking at, (laughs) but like, it's all really cool to have seen what we've seen and, and and done what we've done but i remember the reason i kind of really started thinking of going to germany and why i finally made that final decision was the end of um the end of year meeting after dayton and this coach was very honest he became the head pro scout of pittsburgh and like he knew players and he knew who could make it and our end of year meeting he's like what are you thinking for next year and i said well I'm not really sure. Cause I'm not really sure where I fit in around here, but like Europe seems appealing. And he said, well, like realistically at the end of the day, you could go there and get all those life experiences. And like, at the end of the day, it's kind of what's in your bank account. Like you can grind away in the East coast for a couple more years, but like, is that what you want out of hockey? And man, I took that. I ended up, getting a random phone call to go to Germany and I never looked back. And once I got over there, I remember saying the first three years I was over there, I would never, ever, ever think about going back to North America to try and grind it out. Yeah. I mean, that's that coach who, or scout who told you that's, it's, it's a, a message. Sometimes a player, you need to hear that perspective sometimes. And, and some, you know, even from someone who, who's coaching you over, over there in North America, sometimes you need a person to give you some clarity on, on where you're at in your career right now and be honest, you know, take an honest look at yourself in the mirror and your abilities and, and what you want out of the game. And sometimes it's not what you want to hear, but, and, you know, I think a lot more players need to, you know, be self-aware and just, you know, Europe's a great option to, to grow and, and extend your career and uh you know broaden your mind as a human too because there's so much benefits to being and living over there experiences you can't you can't get um you know in north america and and so yeah no i 
Yeah, I I couldn't agree more, which I keep saying on this podcast to everybody that talks to me. Um, so you did, though, go back to uh, North America after one year in the Elsvensk in the second league in Sweden. Um, I, I, I don't want to get into too much about that, which I'm kind of curious because I never played in Sweden, but I heard like guys don't get many points and it's a very clutch and grab type defensive systems, right? Yeah. I mean, it's the, yeah, the point system and, you know, they don't give out as, you know, the easy, the second assist, so to speak as, as loosely as some other leagues and you have to really earn that second assist. So that's why the points, if you look at the, you know, a point per game in that those Swedish leagues that you're, you're in the top 10 for sure. And doing well, because, you know, it's like those, those two leagues are, it's good hockey and, and, you know, it's the Swedes play physical and, and understand the game so it's it's tighter as far as you know scoring points um but yeah it's also the way you know they structure the pat the assist and and all that because sometimes you can sneak a few cheesy apples that you probably <laughs> wouldn't have gotten and can kind of whether it's a second off your skate and, and all that stuff so sometimes those add up to two more points and some you know they really look at look at that sometimes so that's why the you know if you're a point per game is is really really good in uh, those swedish leagues and now you know it's it's a hockey country it's it's big time they televise both leagues you know the paper is full of hockey and um it's a lot like canada it's, it's their number one sport so it's it's big time over there and it was it was good development too to see how the they developed the, the youth program and, and their coaching and at, and that was 2000 one and to see you know all that development now and how the players they develop you just see what they what they accomplish now at the, at the world stage no you're right like it's like seeing what the u.s is doing with now all the nhl players that have now migrated down there and have had sons and then have i have uh coached the yeah. kids sweden um is a hockey country and i don't think canada realizes like how many and it's like you said like it broadens your horizons like going over there and seeing like i didn't realize how many hockey players there were in the world growing up like i really didn't get it with all those other countries i didn't get how many hockey players there are out there yeah i mean i think a lot of to be honest a lot of people in canada think that way as well you know like um, just being back and in, in retired and being back here in the lower mainland, um, you kind of want to talk to parents and, and some players and just be like, it's competitive. You're not just competing with the guys down the street or the guys in the organization two hours away. It's there's you're, you're competing against the world for these spots, you know, and the, if you look at NHL rosters, how many guys are on a team 20? 22 players, there's, you know, 12, four positions, seven, you know, D spots. It's competitive. It's, you know, they don't just give those out for free, those spots. So it's, it's, it's talking to these parents sometimes and, and kids to mot- not to discourage them, but to understand that, you know, there's a lot of kids playing and you got to compete at, at every level and every level you got to rise, rise to the top to make it. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, okay, so after Sweden, you end up deciding to go back to North America then. What's that decision like? And um, give me just a brief rundown of North America and then how you go back to Europe. Because we're, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I came back just that, like I said, the decision to try and chase and see, you know, see if you can, you have what it takes to, to, climb the ladder and play in the NHL. And I just had that, you know, I got to give it a go at least because I was going to stay in Sweden and, and kind of set up shop there um, at, a, at a good year there and, and wanted to, you know, play in the elite league and, and have a long career there too. So I just, but I just had this earning to try to try it at least. So I went to Vegas, they're an expansion team um, that year. And uh, I thought what a, not a bad place to play and start your, your journey then in Las Vegas um in the coast right and then just you know, in, in the coast yeah and it was it was uh like that west division was pretty interesting like a lot of old players you know that played on the west coast and 
some good players too, because everyone wanted to play in San Diego and Vegas and all these sweet cities for good reason. Um, and then you you kind of you know you get called up to the A and do that 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 kind of dance in Lowell and the ups and downs for those three years it was yeah it was, you know East Coast and that AHL shuffle um, and then you just kind of see the writing on the wall pretty early like how you know it, it's and just that lifestyle wasn't for me um, just like being shipped around and, and you know it's a, it's an opportunity for sure but I just for for me and my personality. I got to a point where I just it wasn't, you know, why I want to play the game and and you're expendable and, and all that. And it's part of the business, but I just like thought like if I'm gonna do this, I wanna, you know, grow a bit and 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 see the world again and and get paid to do it, you know, for a long time, not just uh, you know, the contracts and the coast and, and what guys, you know, take home is it, is it's a grind. So yeah, that's where the Europe kind of came back and I, I, I went back over after three years of, of doing that. I, I, don't, I don't regret it. I, I enjoyed that time and all the players and the experiences because, you know, it's, it's good times and, and, you know, playing Vegas was, was really fun. Um, but the, you know, the business side of that life and, and what comes with that wasn't, wasn't for me in Europe was definitely a fit for me and personality wise and hockey and the way I play the game, to be honest, uh, uh suits suits me a lot better over there and i knew that so i yeah because you i could see what like especially what the minor leagues were like back when we were breaking in like the minor leagues if you were six four like you are and a skilled guy um if you're six four you're expected to like fight right like because that's and like you were a skilled six four guy you were skilled as skilled as they get yeah that's the thing like you get you know you get for whatever reason that era it's if you were big and and my size you definitely had to you know fight more than and for me it's it's part of the game in that era but it wasn't what i was you know my skill set so there was always that battle right in your your mind and and you know playing for someone else's expectations of you just to go out and fight to prove that you're tough and and the toughness thing was a big thing and you know as a big guy you're supposed to you know that doesn't to me that doesn't define toughness sometimes but in that era if you were six four and didn't fight you know you, you got you had to you know play in a certain situations so yeah yeah it's you're right though and like i remember back in the day like i would i would do it a few times at the coast, like I would fight just to prove I was tough, uh, just to prove I would do it because everybody was doing it. And that was just the way it was. Yeah. Yeah. It was just that era. And I think, you know, it's part of the game. Um, but it, for my skill set and, you know, how I like to play the game, uh, Europe was definitely a better fit for me. And, and, you know, now it's, you see the game and the way the NHL has gone and, and then the new wave of, of hockey, it's, it's almost removed completely. Right. So it's interesting to see the last, the transition from just the mindset of, of players now and, and, and organizations and scouts and all that. So. Yeah. It, the, the, everything's changed. Like literally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything's changed from when guys like myself and you were coming up. Um, but like, I wouldn't change a thing. What a, what a, blast it was uh but one thing i would say is like personality wise i understand what you're saying about europe was a better fit because Mm -hmm. europe was more of a team atmosphere you were a team like you Mm -hmm. either figured it out as a team or you didn't where the east coast and the ahl those guys are not on teams those aren't teams that's not how you grow up as a kid playing on a team in a town and you're on a team for the year the guys in the East coast and the AHL are not on teams and they are not team players. At least they never used to be. And if they are, they act like team players. That's all really a show to try and get up. So whatever. Yeah. Those it's a, t- those are tough leagues. It's a, uh, it's cause it winning isn't the, the main priority a lot, a lot of times in those levels, it's more just, you know, developing players, which 
you know, that's what it's for. So it's hard to, it's a fine dance between, you know, winning a championship and producing the most NHL ready players that these organizations have to, to face. Right. So it's, that's why you only see a few teams in the A winning the championship, you know, consistently or having good runs is, is they grab players um, differently, but it, it's, you know, it's a tough league to coach, I'm sure. And, Cause you're, you know, you have guys that might be better on the power play, but they have to, you know, look at their, where they fit in with the organization as a whole and not just if they're going to win that game tonight with, with the best lineup. Right. So. Yeah. And there, I had no idea when I got to pro hockey, what it was actually like, like that the coach in the East coast, he ain't putting together his own lineup. There's someone telling him, well, I don't know how it all works and I'm not going to pretend to know, but yeah. yeah, North America wasn't for me and it wasn't for you. And then we go to Europe, but like, so you decide to go back and in 2006, seven, you play on three different teams before you become the goat of beating So what happens playing on three teams the first year over there, because like I literally play, I never got traded. I ever switched teams. I don't know how you go from three teams in one year, the first year over there. Yeah. Yeah, It was, uh, you know, that was a a real like growth year for me too, personally. And just, uh, you know, what I wanted, how I wanted to have my career up. Honestly, that was, you know, sometimes the hard, hard times you learn a lot about yourself and, uh, that year was definitely challenging, um, but I, I, I'm glad I went through it because, yeah, I started Switzerland. You know, I had a good deal in, in the Swiss league there coming back because I had a good year in the coast the year before. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I went to S- Switzerland and it didn't work out for whatever reasons. You know, as an import, you have expectations. And, um, you know, sometimes when the team has a different agenda, it doesn't and you don't fit it, it just doesn't fit. And sometimes that leads to your own ice performance as well. And you part ways, which is not bad. It's just part of the business. And, you know, you go, you talk to your agent and what's out there in October kind of thing. And at that point, it's, you're just kind of looking to get to play and make money and, and salvage year. And you go to Austria and same kind of thing. It was, a, that was an interesting uh, situation, but you know, it had success and you think it all, it's all good, but, there's a lot of things that go on behind closed doors that are out of your control and, and so you just got to roll with it. So then I ended up in Italy just to play, just to finish the year. And, you know, that was an amazing experience playing in, in Italy and, and the lifestyle and, and the food and the culture and, and just playing for fun again for that last little bit, you know, it, it was a fun atmosphere and, and, and then you, you reevaluate where you're at as a player after a year like that. And, see you know what you want to do at this point i think i was 26 or 27 years old and you just i took a pause for a bit and stayed a little longer in uh, north america that summer just i had some offers in denmark and and stuff and back in sweden and and then the opportunity in germany came up to try it i never you know played in germany so i thought why not and then uh, the rest was history after um signing in beatingheim and um develop that that relationship there in that career and so no it's uh what a great decision that was because uh but yeah. like every league over there is so different and yeah. they're so different based on what country they are and the type of people they are and their their culture like the danish people it like the Denmark hockey, they're the nicest folk. Every one of them would win, win the Lady Bing every year. Like, yeah. nobody even two hands anybody. Nobody, like, it's, yeah, it's actually kind of like a regular season NHL game. But anyways, every league's different. Switzerland, you got to score a ton. Like, you don't have two points a game after 10 games your first year. You're pretty, you could be cooked, right? Yeah, it was just that that experience, stuff like that. Like you're used to, you know, I was there to produce, and that's part of the gig. But sometimes it, you know, of a course of a season, you're gonna put up the numbers you put up. Sometimes it doesn't happen the first month. Sometimes it takes time to get going, and then you end up, you know, with with the production that you're capable of. It just 
you know, it doesn't come when you want it all the time. Um, and, you know, as an import, sometimes teams don't wait for that to happen. And like you said, in Switzerland, they're a little harder on, on imports and they expect a lot. And I just wasn't accustomed to that at that time. Like Sweden was a whole different experience um, there. You know, it's a real well-rounded game. And if you, you know, maybe you don't score that game, but you play good defense or you, you do other things to help win, they acknowledge it and understand it. Where in Switzerland, I just felt it was point driven and completely um, two or three, four points, four points a game. And, and uh, some of the conversations I had off the ice were something I've never heard before. And so it, it just, you got to get accustomed to these different leagues and how they think. And I was pretty green as well with, with that kind of, so you just learn and, and, you know, say thank you for the opportunity and kind of move on. Cause that's just how that those leagues are, are going to go. And sometimes a lot of, you know, you can make a lot of money in, in those leagues too and um, have success for a long time. It's just what you're accustomed to and, and what fits. Well, I would say it's also just like how myself and yourself, like we didn't really find our footing in North America, but I, I don't think I would have liked playing in Switzerland, the whole point driven. Cause I knew that's what it was like. And like, if you play there, like it's not about winning and losing maybe until playoffs. Like it's about, it's about scoring. And if you're not scoring, the fans are like, why aren't you scoring? But it's time to move on because you're not the goat there. <laughs> and it's a pretty interesting journey that like you go through all that to now everything else that's still to come. <laughs> and I, like, yeah. so now you go to beating Heim. I'm not there yet. You, I know you yeah. played with that Jacques guy. Cause we put you out of the playoffs one year, but did you, that was, was that the first year you were there? Yeah. Uh, just the year before you, I think you were in my student. Um, you know, Brady was our coach that year too. And, and, uh, you know, they wanted to me to stay for the following year. And then I signed that's, you know, in that end of that season. Um, and then, you know, we developed, we put together that roster that off season. And like you talked about with Greg, the coming in July and, and bonding and, you know, they, they spent a lot of money on that team to, to go up to, you know, to the first league. Um, Cause it was, you could do that at that time. Um, they had the budget, they had the sponsors and, and they, they wanted to win. So they constructed that team and um, yeah, it was, it was a wild ride. You know, you end up winning the championship and that kind of um, sets you on that path with that city. When you win the first championship with the city, it's, it's, you know, they'll, they'll never forget that. So that, that, that party and that parade and that experience with the town, you know, connected us as players to that city because it was their first championship and they've been waiting so long for it. And then, you know, it just exploded and then carried me um, to retirement, basically, as far as that run with the beating I'm and, and coming back there. Yeah, no, it's good that uh, like you got to get out when you did um, mm. uh, like, cause you got out. I hurt my knee. Um, you still did everything you would have done without me, which made it, 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 it hurt my heart a little bit, but like, I knew how good you were. And that's why I resigned there was to play with you. And, um, I hurt, I hurt my knee. And then after that year, you do get up to the first league in the DL, which good for you, but then I'm still there. And I realistically never get a settlement like you again in my life. Um, and it just hurts my heart, but it's okay. Um, Cause it was a great year. Um, and I just wish we would have played more. Like I still do like, because I, what, what you say about winning that championship, setting you up playing yeah. with you set me up because so my playoff run in land suit, I get offered by both teams we put out and then I'm doing well, but then I play with you the next year and then all of a sudden I'm second in the league and scoring and win the championship. And like you yeah. set me up in Europe for the next decade. So thank you for that. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, it's a, it's a team, you know, it's like I said, when you have chemistry with guys and, and you can have success in Europe and, and kind of build your resume, 
it does it does set you up for years of, of you know, getting contracts and getting you know looked at all the time so it, it works both ways you know we had success individually and, and together is you know we had a lot of fun so it, it helps us both you help me and um, in that stretch as well and it, yeah it would have been fun to play that second year and, and to be honest if we didn't have all those injuries i think we could have went back to back with that with that team yeah um, like you, you never know which way the path's gonna go <clears throat> The way I always envision it, you know, is like me and you would have played that year together, ripped it up again together. And then some yeah. DL team would have signed us to be their second line or whatever. And then we would have just grooved there. And then it would, you know, we would have been like, you know, but, <laughs> but we never played together again. So let's move on. Okay. So you went to beating Hyman, you got out during the dark years when the budget went down. So the yeah. year we win, the budget goes down a little bit or whatever, but they decide they can't go up to the first league, even though that was the whole intent of the whole thing. And that's why we put in all that money into that team was to go to the first league. And then we win and don't go up. Right. So then after that, you go actually get up to the first league, right. After that year where I'm hurt, uh, you get your contract in the first league. So where do we go from there? Yeah, like we played the two years that one year you hurt. Like you said, we didn't you – know, we made the semifinals there and lost. And then, you know, I was just thinking – I was going to stay in Beatingheim long-term at that point too. And, like, I had some opportunities in the DEL and, and just, you know, I did a lot in the second league in those three years personally and team success. So I just thought I'd give it a try and – um you know, so I signed in, in Krefeld and in the next year in Dusseldorf and did the DL thing. And to be honest, I just always, I liked beating him. I liked the structure in the, in the city. And so in the head, in my, in my head, I always wanted to come back, but, and then I got hurt in Dusseldorf and then I sat back and Brittig was the coach actually. So he called me, wanted me to stay in, in Dusseldorf because I tore my knee in Dusseldorf as and was out, but uh, he was taking a coaching job, so he called me privately, and he wanted me to stay. And <clears throat> I just thought I needed a change because we spent, like you talked about on your other podcast with Greg, that you know, coming in July and just uh, what he's about. Yeah, I knew what he was about, and and he, you know, he did a lot for us. He played us a lot, <clears throat> all the all as you know. Uh, but I, I, at that time in my life, I, you know, I was thirty late. Or early 30s and I the time at home was really important to me so like I just didn't want to uh, go back in in July or, or June and and do that grind again nothing against him as a person or a coach I just the time at home when you're you know you're living abroad is, is valuable with with friends and family the eight weeks that you get and so that was the decision not to to stay in Dusseldorf for that time and then I went back to Sweden where I where I started my career um as a 20 year old so I signed back with them and it was a it was it was a special year as well because you know I connected with that town and those fan base how old are you then remember me and it was just a night I was 32 um when I signed 12 years later 12 years later they're still in the all Svenskan at the time the second and so it was just a nice moment to to reconnect with all the people there because it's a small town young v is 14,000 people and um it was nice how they responded to me being back and, and they're you know very gracious to me as a player and so it was, that was a special year actually to have that full circle and come back and and, and play one season there but then, at the end of the day i just wanted to come back to germany i like germany there's a lot of things that playing in germany brings you in security and the lifestyle so i you know i signed back and uh ravensburg there I tried and that was a good Good, had a good season there so, and then uh you know i had the so, reached out to beatingheim i wanted to kind of come back there and, and we actually got a deal done and it, so i spent the, you know four years there which had a lot of su success as well yeah i saw how well you did in ravensburg because i were <laughs> yeah <laughs> i yeah because i i said something i yeah the coach and i that you had there like if me and you could have played together, it would have been great, but I know you made everybody else great around you. So that's all super duper. 
way to go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I remember when um, I was still there and you were trying to come back and he asked me about you and I said, he's the best player in the league. And I said, if me and him play together, we're the top two scorers in the league. And he said, is he fast? And I said, no. And he said, well then, okay. And I said, well, all right. And I said, well, I'll go to hell broad then. I know you yeah. like him. You won championships with him. It's all good. I, I don't have the same relationship with him. You do. And I understand if you win championships with people, you like them. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah, like, it's all good. So yeah. we never got to play together again. So you end up coming back to Ravensburg. So then after he actually sees you play and yeah. realizes you don't actually have to be fast to be good at hockey, then he resigns you in beating Hyman. And then the rest is history. So that's great. Yeah, it worked out. And I, and I told my agent when I left, you know, I was at, after Ravensburg, I was just looking around. And, and when you have a, a year with, like that, you kind of have some suitors, but I just wanted to get a deal done and, and come back to beating him, especially at that stage of my career, my age. And um, just thought it would be a good fit to get something done. So we made it happen and, and grateful it did. Because, you know, looking back, and, that run we had there as well, those four years was, was special as well with those guys. And, and um, yeah. So it was a whole different crew of people because, so basically the people we won with, we, the, after the budget went down, all those players disbanded. Um, I kind of hung on till about the end. Renee made it all the way through with, we got to give him a shout out for a thousand games. That's incredible with one team team yeah, that's uh it's a big honor and testament to him and longevity you know hometown kid it's pretty special for him so i'm happy for the guy yeah that's incredible a thousand games where you only play like 50 games a year so like think about that guy folks he's like playing on the pro team when he's in diapers um anyways so renee congratulations um so how so in those four years you're back there you win two more times? Yeah, two more times. Um, we went to the finals, you know, every year. Um, we, it just is a culmination of a lot of guys at, at that, you know, that similar th mid 30s career and a lot of good players in that league. And, you know, guys taking less money to play with each other. And it was a similar kind of culture, like when we had everyone got along and, and brought something to the table and, and everyone you know, it was, wasn't playing for chasing contracts anymore. It seemed like it was, you know, just they're happy all playing beating on at the same time at that stage in their career and just have success. And that's why we, we had the, that run that we did. Um, the mindset was the same because sometimes, you, you know, like, you know, when you're on teams, guys are at different stages in their career, different ages. And even when they get to Europe, they're, you know, they're chasing better contracts, more money, and that's what you're supposed to do. And then you hit a point in your career where it's, you know, money is, is part of it, but then, it's, you know, other things are at play. And when you have a whole team like that, um, you can have success in Europe. <clears throat> there, that's one thing I would like to say, though. Like, that is incredible. You guys had that much success. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about the different stages of guys' careers and when they come over, mm -hmm. Everybody that like yourself and I that were trying to make careers out of being in Europe, uh, the people I disliked the most were the guys at their NHL career that just wanted a one year vacation and didn't care who won or lost the game. They were just going to Rome the next day or wherever they were going. And uh, the other guys, no, that was, yeah, no. And then, well, I guess during the lockout, it sucked when those guys came over and they were going to leave come Christmas. And all the fans are so juiced up that they're seeing these guys, which I get it. It's cool. But like all the guys that affected that actually had jobs and like kids and families that were over there. And all of a sudden, these guys that are in a lockout decide to come over and like, uh, piss on our party yeah just a different mindset when and 
guys is yeah guys i feel like that's changed too i mean as i you know i played a long time in europe you saw a lot of guys that had nhl resume and come over and at different stages and i mean i saw a lot of like at my time a lot of guys wouldn't come over till 30 right they'd do the ahl nhl thing till they're like at least 10 11 years and they come over and then play a few more but it's uh it's it, yeah and even the clubs used to you know sign guys with nhl games to big money and, and that kind of has changed as well just because they're doing their due diligence on players and 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 a lot of guys are coming over with the intent to have long careers now it's changed what well, i think talking to young players they're aware of europe now at a young age and, and what it can bring financially and lifestyle like it didn't happen so much at our time i, I think but the more i played the, the guys would come over and be like kells why didn't you tell me come over here like five years ago you know like I was just, yeah everybody knows about it now right <laughs> yeah it's like now like guys are coming right they play one or two years in the north american leagues and they're gone or they're gone after college and um you know the longevity thing like you talked about it is it's a real thing if you can you know have a few good years and, and piece together consistency you can have a, a long career and a, and a great career over there Okay, here's my next question. This wasn't even on the notes, and I know we've been going long, but this is the GOAT episode. So um, I actually only played, I think, one game in the new arena in Beatingheim. I was all old school, right? I was always promised if I stayed around Beatingheim long enough, I'd get to play in this arena, which I... <laughs> I, th I played once for Helbron. <laughs> so um, how was it? Like, was it different once it wasn't like small ice and it was Olympic ice? And uh, like, how much did it change from the start to the end? Because it's, the same things happened in my hometown with a little old rink to now a, a new rink that looks like the rest of them. Yeah, it was, you know, I, for me coming from the old rink and then, the new culture when I signed back there like four or five years later, it was, it was different, man. I, I liked the old rink, to be honest. I liked the small barn and the low ceiling and the fans on top of it. It was not the best rink, but the ice was probably the best in the league because it was such an old facility. Um, and walking through the crowd, like that dressing room we had, you had to walk through the crowd. There's just some characteristics that you can't, you know, duplicate in these new buildings. And it loses some, you know, character in my opinion. They're great. They're beautiful facilities, and that's good too. But sometimes you, you, those like fans being able to pour beer on you, and you know them smoking cigarettes in the in the concourse. It's like it's good and not good at the same time. And these, and then you have these <clears throat> beautiful facilities that have all the, you know, state of the art, you know, weight rooms, and it's it's great too. And you get comfortable, uh, but sometimes you miss that kind of raggedy. Kind of vibe and because it brings your team together sometimes when you have these conditions that aren't perfect and, I, and you know sometimes teams rally you know when they're in these circumstances so it's but i, I like the new rank too is you know very um luxurious and all those things that i talked about and but then the rank's right there so we did practice on it sometimes and you kind of reminisce about our era so it was, it was good it was i like that i could have both uh, eras to to go on as my memories because they're both good so the old rink is still usable? Like people still go yeah. on it? Yeah, the, the rink's still usable. They just took out the fans that like the, the blocks of the, where the fans um, sit. Yeah. So, so it's just basically like a normal, like minor hockey rink kind of vibe. So you can, it's still usable and they, we practiced on it a few times. Um, and it was funny because like my last year we had to, because they were having a, a tournament or a, ice capades for a couple of weeks or something that we had to change dress rooms and they put us in the old dress room for for a while and it was just it brought back a lot of memories because it was <laughs> you know going from that nice facility to this and just it was it was fun guys had a good time those two weeks it was over christmas so you you know got, you know practice was kind of peppy because the ice was cold and everyone's wearing layers and, and it's just you know it was a good change from from the other rink actually for a short time um, yeah, I, I totally get it. It was just like when, uh, Lance, we weren't, we, the, the team told us we weren't good enough to, 
used the pro locker room. So we were sent to the junior locker room and it actually brought the team together. Um, but uh, it's like, let, it's kind of like when you play in these small towns that there's one pub or, or one pub to go to and, you know, the whole team goes to that one pub. They're not going to, you know, 20 different places, establishments or whatever for dinner, you, you know, you congregate at this one spot and it, it you know, it leads to good times just because the, it forces you together. So it's, it's kind of that, what I like to think of it as as well. No, it, it was, you're right though. It was exactly what I needed in my life. It was when I went to Lansud and Beedingheim, both places were like a small town, almost like you were like playing for like a junior team in Canada. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You just, you know, you see people on a daily basis cause it's so small. So you get to know fans and people in the city on a personal level. Cause you're, it's, it's small and, it you know i think it helps you it leads to success and it you know makes players want to play harder for that community i find and and then you build relationships and then they come support you at the rink and you know guys feed on that you know that's why guys like playing there i feel like guys always remember you know that success from both eras and and that's why guys you know some some of the guys set up shop and live there when they're done playing so well, yeah. community Beating high was a beautiful spot. I, I, I really did like everybody around there. I felt like I was part of the community. Lisa felt like she was part of the community. Like Beckham even did like the dog when even went to practice with me and would, uh, this was after you left, the dog was allowed to come to practice, but like, you know, it was, it was, it was a great spot. It was a very special spot in my life. Um, I wish that obviously we would have played together again, um, yeah, I thought we were going to play on the retirement game. I tried to get you out. But. Right. So that's where I was going next um, was your retirement night. Um, you invited me to fly over to Germany um, and you play in a game that's for you. But I just, <laughs> the randomest thing in the world is I just happened to have a Wally night in Cardiff for the same month. And uh, when you work a real job, you can't uh, take uh, a full month off work to go to Cardiff and then to Germany for your own night. And then for your buddy's Jersey retirement. So that was an interesting month in my life when I had both of those options. Yeah. And I, I throw it out there to, to you and some other guys from Canada and just, I know there's obligations, but that just happened to coincide with your special night as well. So it's, it just, it is what it is. No, but like, seriously, like I was so grateful because like we were big and little sexy, man. Like mm -hmm. um, we, if we would have played together in that second league for f however many years it could have been, it would have been a, it would have been a show, but my knee did not cooperate and then you did too good without me. So then you were gone. And then by the time you came back, the coach didn't like me and I was out of there and it just never happened. There was a time I was even trying to get you to Cardiff to go back to school. But anywho. I, know. I remember that I just had, I had a few multi-year deals. So I couldn't uh, get out of them, but I was always, I was looking at uh, England as well later in my career and, I just happened to hit the stride with beating on that second leg and, and uh, have some success. No. So um, how like, cause you're a Canadian from Vancouver area that has his Jersey retired in Germany. So what was that like night? Like, like, cause mm -hmm. I, I got to play on Dirk's team when uh, he got his Jersey retired, but he was from Beedingheim and I was already playing for the team. Can you give everybody like give a rundown of what you got to do for that night? And I am very sorry. I wasn't there. I would have loved to be there and we would have got big and little sexy back together for at least one shift, whether those new guys were bigger, stronger, whatever they were, if they looked better naked, that's fine. But big and little sexy were better than them and they know it. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, uh, it was pretty overwhelming, um, to get that, you know, they, so I 
played in Dagendorf one year the following season. The first game was against Beatingheim after we won the championship in 2018. And then they announced that to the fans that night that they're going to retire my jersey when I retire. So it okay, you kind of know on, what's hold coming hold in the back of your mind. What? No, you're playing for another team and they say they're going to retire jersey yeah. when you're done. So how do you end up in Dagendorf and why are you not in Beatingheim if they're saying they're going to retire a jersey? But not yet because we want him to play for somebody else first. No, like I, so we won the championship in 2018 with Beatingheim and, you know, I thought I was going to retire then, um, kind of call it. And then I go back for the summer and you're kind of, summer goes by and like most athletes, you're itching to play again. So I just signed with uh, Dagendorf to, and went over. And, but the first game of the season was against Beatingheim to unveil the cup and the banner of the championship. So it was a special night for me, you know, the reception that night was special for myself and the reaction from the crowd that night. And they just announced it, you know, that when I was on the blue line there with Dagendorf. And so I, I knew then that the, that was the plan when I finished playing my career, whenever that was, that they were going to hang up, you know, 27 in the, in the, in the rink. And uh, so you, and then I retired after that, that year, you know, some injuries and then um, they set the date for it the following season in, in October, November range around their break. And so you kind of know it's coming in the back of your head and you, you, you don't think about it and you think about it and they say, you know, yeah, I'm allowed to bring back players um, who I've played with to play in this game. So you start reaching out to guys like yourself and, and old teammates to see, you know, if guys are available to play in this, this kind of game and night and, and, you know, some guys can't, some guys can. And it was, you know, it was a lot, it was an overwhelming week. You know, my family flew over my parents and sister and niece and nephew. And just that week was, you know, it was special. It was humbling because, you know, a lot of attention on yourself for, for a few days and, players fall, flying from Canada, they're spending their own money to come to this, um, this a game and event. And so you, you, and you reminisce with the old players and it was, it was special. It was, uh, it was, it was, you know, I didn't get emotional like, till after, till I landed back in Canada just to reflect. Cause you're kind of in a, a whirlwind for a few days, just with all the action and the, and the hoopla that goes with, you know, being center of attention kind of thing, which it's not always my strength. Uh, kind of like to hide in the back and, and hide a bit. So you, you but you know, four thousand people showed up on a random night to to watch this game, and, and you know, they did, they weren't getting that many fans during the season. So the players were like, "We don't get this many fans," and anyway. you know, so it was it was pretty spectacular. And just the reception, just to watch all the old players. You know, they had jerseys with my face on it, and all the players we played in these uniform so that was kind of surreal to see all your old teammates with you know jk27 jerseys and uh, they did a one a great job the organization of putting that together and and creating that event but it was you know the fans and the players really made it special just so it's uh, something you know you look back on there's some videos that guys recorded and uh it was pretty special to have your jersey retired is uh in any any league is pretty humbling and um, surreal, you know, along with the championships to, to have, you know, my number up there, it shows more than uh, my hockey ability. I think, you know, I think it, it shows like how you connect with the, with the city and, and off ice stuff, not just hockey. So it's a, it's a big honor. Um, hundred percent. Yeah. Like, connecting with a town like that and uh for them to bring you back like i knew it was gonna happen i know it's gonna happen for joey martin in cardiff um who's gonna be the next guest uh, but like it's interesting for me because i played with you guys and now i know guys that like have their jerseys retired like i had a wally night for a com like different circumstances you'd say um but like you guys actually have your jersey retired where like nobody for the beating kind of Steelers could wear number 27 ever again and like 
to think about when we used to help out with the junior teams and the kids in that town and like now your jersey's retired there that's that's incredible man yeah it's and you know even my buddies that because i was gone for 20 years you know so i you know you connect with buddies but then they at the end of the, they see that that accomplishment and they're just you know they, where have you been it's pretty remarkable to hear the reception and and the feedback from having that honor and sometimes you f- forget it how big it is but it's it's you know that'll be there past past me and in my life and like I said, the biggest thing for me is the human side of, of that. It's, it's not just putting up points. You know, anyone has can have success in, with the points and, and individual success, but to have, that's like a culmination of everything. And so it's, it's, it's something I, I appreciate and, and acknowledge a lot. Well, man, I couldn't be prouder of you because like, yeah, like I, I was all in too. And I know why you like beating him so much. Like I loved it too. It's a great spot. Like I, I was, I loved it too. And I, for you, that to have happened to you, man, that's incredible. Um, They had fantastic fans. It was a fantastic town, fantastic people in the town. Yeah. I, um, that I was there at the start of it to think of all the years you spent there afterwards and all the memories you have, I, I can't even imagine. Right. Yeah. It was, it was, I mean, those four years, it was not easy. I went through a lot of, you know, concussion issues and I, it was a weird four years because, you know, you had a lot of personal success and team success. And I also had a lot of dark times with the head stuff. So it was a, it was four years of, 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 you know, ups and downs, but, uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting to look at that block, you know, from the, from the whole, from the whole lens. Uh, okay. This is random before I ask you, remind me to ask you about concussions and injuries, but I got to ask you a question. I remember you used to do some really freaky workouts before games and we'd all make fun of you before we'd go play two touch and I remember you'd be out there and you'd be jumping around. Um, I'm pretty sure I did that workout at the end of my career um, with, in Cardiff when the coach gave me the gag ball, right? Is it a gag ball where it goes on your arms and your legs and then you got bands on your ankles and then you just kind of like jump around and like I, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah that's, that was the, that device came later, but what I was doing was basically that just before that was made. Um, it was the same kind of idea with the bands and everything, but that, that ball came later as they invented it and developed it. But yeah, it, it uh, I remember you guys used to watch me doing that weird stuff, and, which is now pretty common in, in the, the hockey warm up scene now. It's, it's, so <laughs> it's, it's uh, a lot of that stuff has been funny to watch even as I got older, I was, you know, I do stuff and now it's that guys are doing it and you get chirped, you know, I got chirped a lot for a lot of things you do and, and now it's common place. So it, it was, it's funny to see that evolution of warm ups and, and nutrition and, and, and stuff <laughs> as I've gone in my career. Cause I definitely heard all oh, good fun and you get ripped for doing weird, weird shit sometimes, but um, it was just, I had, I had to take care of my body in different ways and learn uh, uh, other methods to, to have a longer career because like you know when you're pounding weights and, and the trainings evolve so when you're pounding weights a lot as a young kid you get and not doing it properly and, and you know you got to learn to to take care of your body yourself and, and other methods so I, i'd always re- research different things and, and connect with the right people to to as to what the latest and and new trends are so i, I try everything yeah and i guess that's how you become a goat because like when I saw you doing that <laughs> shit, I was like, I don't even like, I don't even want to get into that. I just want to go play two touch with the boys and hang out and play soccer. But then at the end of my career, the Cardiff coach who was from out West Vancouver area, Andrew Lord brought this gag ball to me and this other old guy in the team and said, you're not lifting weights this year. And then we got into this thing where we were doing squats and twisting and jumping. And I'm like, 
I think Justin was doing this 10 years ago and it was like, right. Yeah. It was, yeah, it's, it's, that, it's been fun to watch that aspect of like how, you know, the, I used to have, like when I'd sign it, it with clubs in Europe, I used to have a conversation in the summer with a lot of the coaching staff just to give them a heads up. Like I was completely honest, like I'm not going to be able to do, nor do I want to do all the, you know, off ice stuff that the team will be doing based on my injury history. And I said, you know, I, you know, I'm going to do work just as hard, but it will be in a, a different aspect, you know? So, you, and they're always cool with it at the start until you get to camp. And, you know, when the team's riding the bike, I would do stairs or skip or just something that I knew I couldn't, I didn't want to get hurt on the ice. Right. There's a, and you're paying me to show up on the ice. So it, it was always funny, these conversations that I had to have in my career at the start with coaches and earning their trust and getting to, to buy into that. I'm working just as hard. Um, it might not look like it from the outside, but I'm doing things that will prepare me for the ice and keep me in shape. And it, it was always a rocky road with that stuff, to be honest, with, with, with coaches. And then by the end of the year, when I had success individually or the team, it was all good. You know what I mean? It took like four or five months to earn that trust and me perform well, obviously, to get them to buy into like, okay, let's just let him do the band weird shit on the side. <laughs> It took four to five months. It took four to five months for your teammates to buy into that shit. <laughs> That's true. Like just once they get some of your, your quirks as a player and, and some of your routines and, um, you know, you, you get ripped, but it's all good. And it, it's, it's funny to see how it's all transpired in time. Uh, no, like, cause when I did that workout, I literally had never felt better. I didn't lift weights. I was like, I was moving, I was shaking, and uh, I was like 10 games into the season, hurt my knee, and it was all over. But, like, yeah. no, it, you, I, yeah, I felt well, better. Yeah. I mean, your prime example of, like, with your athletic ability has nothing to do with what you can do off the ice in the gym, right? Like, and in Europe, you're paid – it's it's – Hire, you're paid to produce as an import. So if you don't, it's not like in the NHL where you get a five-year deal, right? Like they'll fire you in two months if you're not producing and they'll just buy you out and you're gone. Like you have to produce every year. And so like your prime, your athletic, it does nothing to do with off ice. If you show up and score 30 goals, like who cares how you did it off the ice? Like what you're doing off the ice, right? Like it, it, it to me, it was always that debate of like, yeah, you got to show up and be professional, but if it's in this realm of, of your routine and, and it enables you to, you know, produce what they want you to produce and paying you to do, then, you know, you should, it's open to have this conversation with staff and management. Well, and being cutting edge with stuff, I guess that makes hard conversations, right? Sometimes. Yeah. It was, it was funny though. I, I be totally honest at the start in, in summer and camps and, and then I get to uh, have these private meetings and you know why aren't you squatting heavy with the team I'm like well I'm 6'4 and if I do that squat lifting I'm going to pull my groin or something and you're going to go on the ice and I'll be out for four to six weeks and then you're going to replace me anyway so you know at, at some point you have to in Europe it, it works a little differently with that too because it's still it's sometimes it could be the wild wild west when it comes to this stuff too so oh yeah no it was a tough day when uh Beatingheim brought in to tommy gobble um and i had hurt my knee and uh i was done for the year and they bring in a five foot seven right-handed shot right winger and i was like oh that hurts <laughs> Anyways, okay. Well, dude, do you got anything else left to say before we hang up? All I got to say is basically, I think we've covered how you end up being a goat in Beatingheim. Um, there was a whole new group of guys, a whole new culture, which was built from that new coach. Way to go, Kevin. Good job. Um, I wish I could have been a part of it. Cause it, you know what? I really did enjoy that town and I enjoyed the people, but what you've done in your career, man, 17 years pro 11 in Germany, a retired Jersey, 
Um, like in Germany, where no German kid in Beatingheim can ever wear number 27 because that's Justin's number, right? Um, you played in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven countries. So, like, that's quite the quite the run. Yeah, it was, I mean, like, that's the ride. Like, that's why I went to Europe is that ride, and it, uh, I'm grateful for that journey because it grew me to this day and how I want to live my life and all the stuff I've learned from cultures and people from all these different places I've lived. It's, um, you know, I'm appreciative of the game and where the game took me. And I, I was able to use hockey, like we talked in the, before this, about as a vehicle to to see the world and and um, and grow as a person. So when you look back at your career, sometimes, yeah, the NHL is not, it wasn't the NHL dream, but I, I'm proud of the, the journey I was able to go on with hockey and where it's taken me. And uh, it's, you know, spurred me to uh, the next, you know, I'm turning 40 here soon in the next 40 years of, you know, how to see the world and, and live the life that I want to live based on that experience in, in, in Europe. So, yeah, no, it, it does make you the person you are and uh, dude, like playing with you. I know you're a fantastic dude. Um, like when we won the championship in Germany and all those guys on that team, it was incredible. Um, the one funny story I wanted to bring up before we hang up was uh, it was my first month in Beatingheim. Um, Marcel Neumann books a vineyard tour for us. Um, and yeah. your your mom's in town. So we go to the vineyard and uh, Lisa and I are getting ready to be engaged. So we're like by the, the, you know, the grape trees, like being all cute and, you know, holding each other and doing our engagement photos. And then the night turned a bit. Then we had a few bottles of wine and we had a good time, right? And then, uh, then um, I was so new in Germany, I guess I didn't quite figure out what was the boys and girls bathroom, right? So you go ahead with that story. I wasn't there. I, I mean, I was upstairs, at, you know, I was with Schmidt and, and the rest oh. of the crew. Up, up so we didn't, uh, we just, you came up and my mom came up and then you told the story from there. So we, we didn't witness it. We just heard about it. Like, Oh dear. You're right. Uh, you're right. I'm going to have to tell the story. Got the bathrooms mixed up and my poor mom walked into you, you know, in a situation she probably wishes she didn't see. <laughs> you guys got, <laughs> you guys got close real fast. You bonded, you bonded, you bonded that night for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell, tell her I say hello. And, um, I'm sorry. I did not know Damon and Heron <laughs> back in the day. And um, after dinner, sometimes you just got to go to the bathroom. And uh, my bad. So sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll pass on the message. She, you know, she loved you all, and, and uh, that was just that was a great night. That was a, that was a really fun night, and it, you know, bond, like those nights bond you as a team, and. Uh, you know, like you talked about before, the imports got together um, early and it gelled quick. So those are the nights that you know set you up for success as a as a team. Well, and I, it's it's also all that, but then it's also like guys like you that are goats that are doing weird workouts and just being better than everybody, and uh, you know, just have uh, a bigger perspective because like when you were doing all those workouts it never even crossed my mind right like i was just doing what everybody else was doing and i was just following along like a sheep yeah it's it's just being curious and, and trying new things and seeing what works for you and you know that's what going to europe is too is sometimes like the path the nhl isn't there for you but 
just try, try it and, and, and figure it out for yourself. Because it, it might work for me, it won't work for you. And you, you just, with the body and those warm ups and stuff that I was doing, it was just basically experimenting to see how it translates to to the ice, right? And see, you know, if I would get tweaks here and there. And if I did, I wouldn't do it. And then I'd try something else. And then it just kind of, you kind of make your own system for, you know, as you get older and you, you realize what your body needs and doesn't need to have success and, and have longevity. So, um but. sorry can i ask one more question before we hang up i know it's been very long but uh we talked about injuries you keep talking about why you were doing those workouts i i know it had to do with groins and then you got into concussions like what all did you have to deal with in your career um because like when you play till you're what 38 like there's going to be a lot of shit happen to you yeah yeah, I mean, the, the, more early in my career was a lot to do with groins and, and hip flexors, like a lot of hockey players. It's just from uh, bad training protocols for myself and, and my body. And, and then as I got older, I didn't, you know, never had head, you know, head problems or concussion problems till I was 35, 30, yeah, 35 when I had my first one there in Beatingheim. And I ended up having five in that short time. Bad, you know, pretty significant time off I missed almost a year um and you know months at a time and so it's you know those are those are I mean bones and fingers and 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 separated shoulders are kind of easy in a sense when you're dealing with the head and, and what I you know what guys go through and athletes go through when they have head trauma so I would take it like a broken wrist or anything over over the head any day so you, you learn a lot about you know a lot of things and you have time to process a lot of things when you're going through uh concussions and and post you know concussion syndrome and all that and, i mean it's at the forefront of a lot of things and injuries right now but yeah it's not it's not an easy road but it's you have to have the right people around you and, and to support you and uh you know when, even with retirement and concussions it's always it's not a pleasant time so you, you gotta like I said, have support and have the right doctors and, and listen to the right people and, and sometimes just take time. Sometimes I don't think as athletes, we give ourselves time or permission to have time and just kind of rush back to get on the ice because you want the next contract or whatever the outside pressure is. To, and sometimes it just, you just need to take a breath and, 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 and relax and heal first and the, the sport second, you know, so. Yeah, nobody understands the sports second. Like, not yeah. well, it's it, hard. It's that's hard. the hardest when, thing. Yeah, when, when you're a player in that situation, it's it's difficult to you just you're just you know ingrained in us to get back out there because if you haven't had one before and you you're so used to the normal injuries that you've had that you just recover and you know whatever the time frame the docs say right, and then when that doesn't go as planned and you know the weeks turn into months and the months turns into a year it uh it's it's not easy to deal with because you're not used to it and, and you don't always have the right um tools to deal with it as well as athletes you know and sometimes when you talk to other players that go through it it's almost easier to articulate to someone that's gone through it rather than someone that hasn't just because you can't always relate like i couldn't relate to at the time to someone that's suffering or going through it because i i didn't know and then you go through it and then you, you the things you talk about in the the things that you're going through, it's easy to talk to someone that's been there almost. It gives you comfort to understand that, you know, how to deal with it and, and what's happening to you. Um, yeah, <laughs> man, I just lost it. Um, I was going to say like, Oh, what was it? Oh gosh. I just lost it. Yeah. Um, so uh, brain's not working anymore. No, I, uh, I gotta say too, I'm really proud of you for doing this. This is, I think we talked in the pre-show a little bit, just that, you know, I think your message in, in the, the European side of hockey and just the other, other side is, is a, I think more guys need to do stuff like this and, and promote that, you know, the other side of hockey, not just the NHL side. And, and um, I'm proud of you for starting this. It's a, it's a good thing you're doing. So keep it up, man. Well, thank you. Cause like realistically, when I decided to do it, like if you would have asked me 
a week before that, if I would ever host a podcast and do this, I would have said not in a million years. I would never put myself out there like that. That's ridiculous. Um, but I don't know. I, I love it. This is, I haven't talked to you since 2012, man. And you were big sexy and I was little sexy and we haven't talked since. And just like all the other players you're connecting with and will connect with, you know, it's a, it's, it stays you connected to the game in your way and tell your stories. And it also, you know, helps other guys, you know, talk about their, their journey. Cause sometimes you can get, you know, years go by and you forget you were a hockey player or had that career. So it's, you know, this platform that you're giving players to reminisce about, you know, that life that they had in Europe. Um, I think guys appreciate it. And that's why you probably got a lot of guys reaching out and, and uh, happy for you, man. So no, no, man, I I'm happy. I'm happy to talk to you. Like you were very instrumental in my life and you wouldn't know that because like me and you having that season, that set me up for the next season to completely blow apart my knee, but yet still get a contract in Europe when there's thousands of people that want jobs. But because me and you had played so good together, uh, they gave me a contract after a full year off and a PCL reconstruction was because you and I had played so good together. That never would have happened if we wouldn't have played together. So Thank you, sir. No, I, that's that's very kind of you, man. You, you, yeah, it's uh, we just chilled, man, and we were able to have success together, and that's that's what it's about. You know, well, that's I could help. That's what help, pass on some, pass you the puck, and uh, pass on some some tidbits of working out too, and so. Uh, buddy. Well, thanks for coming on and it was great to catch up. Let's stop the recording. So, uh, everybody can take it or I can take a pee. <laughs>